And here we go. Good morning, everyone. Finally, we're here. Morning. Uh, we've got started. My name is Chris Morrison. My name is Jane Secker. We're the Alt Copyright Online Learning Special Interest Group co-chairs. Yep. So here we are. This is what we look like uh, on the big screen. Hey, um, delighted to be here. Yeah, very pleased. Yeah. Uh, again, yet again. So um, uh, we will get back to that slide that I just had there, which actually gives us the title. Yeah, of so what welcome. number it is. What number is it? Welcome everyone who's joining us. And if there's any new time, first time people here, mm -hmm. you're about to find out what this is all around, about. Number 67, after 67, still going strong. Yep, uh, absolutely, yeah. Um, and so what are we looking at today? We have um, copyright news as ever. We have the main thing though today is uh, Sarah Hammond joining us from sunny and cold Cambridge, mm -hmm. talking about the evaluation report that she wrote on these webinars themselves. Uh, so we'll be handing over to Sarah here. So we're doing a bit of navel gazing. Well, a bit of navel gazing. A bit of reflection, I think. Okay. Mindful reflection. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. And just having a chat about what people are interested in and how we can all work together to help each other. Absolutely. Really is what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. Uh, and then there's some stuff, isn't there, about yeah. the actual group itself? Yeah, we're going to talk a bit about the Association for Learning Technologies, Copyright and Online Learning, Special Interest Group. It just chips yep. off the tongue, that, doesn't it? Yes. Um, Chris and I have been the chairs for three years now, uh -huh. so co-chairs, and so we're going to just be chatting about the election process, looking to recruit some people, new people, uh, got Indeed. some posts up for grabs, so there will be expressions of interest, but we'll tell you more about that later. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what have we, we been up to since we last since met? Since we last met. So Chris, what have you been up to? Uh, well, this is what happened over Christmas. My, my brother is a big Tiki Bar fan, so... Um, he ended up buying four different types of rum. And wow. them in. So that was a drink that included four different types of rum. Oh, my goodness. This afternoon. Oh, my um, goodness. So, yeah, that was good. Yes. Fun times. Yes. But not I, as fun as some other times. I, I've, been been quiet, I've just had a quiet yeah. few, few weeks, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you believe that Thank Jane you, has Wendy. reached the age of 30 years old? <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> Still looks good, doesn't it? Uh, yes, um, I've reached actually the half century. I know it's a shock. I know, I know. Mm. Sorry, it's come as a shock. Uh, that was me on Saturday night, um, singing my heart out in the middle of a load of balloons at yeah. the end of the evening. And I thought people know I'm, you know, a, a great, magnificent character. So why not see me in all my glory at okay. the end of the evening? Thank you, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It was a very understated affair, of course, knowing me. You yes. don't like to make a fuss. I don't like to make no, a fuss. No, indeed. No. In fact, if you could have kind of just slipped away without anyone noticing that. Uh, oh, that would have been perfect. Yes. Oh, there we go. Yes. Yes. There was no keynote co presentation, I have to say. No. So in my nor family, parallel sessions. Nor parallel sessions, but no. I did do an icebreaker activity. Okay. I'm sure in the you form did. of barn yes. dancing. Of course you did. Yes. Of course you did. So. Um, Right, so let us uh, move on from this for now. Yes. And what have we got next? Just a reminder, of course, that there is an archive of all the previous mm -hmm. webinars um, available on the Copyright Literacy website and the Alt YouTube uh, channel. They have a playlist there with all of these in them. Yes, they do. Yes. And I think oh. we do have Josh joining us, who's on the yeah. City List programme. I don't know if you're able to post any of the chat, the links in the chat, Josh. Not to worry if you're not. Otherwise, we can we can post links later yeah. um, and the slides will be up. But um, yeah, we, that's I think people know where these are anyway. Yeah. So, um, OK, yeah. so we are now. Right, copyright news. What's yes. in the news at the moment? So, your favourite part of the uh, show when you get to play that jingle. Yeah. Um, and you did actually play the jingle from this podcast, I think, inadvertently when we were swapping between laptops I and had did. a bit of yeah, technical yeah. chaos going on. Um, so, what's all this about? What's all this rock paper swords? Why? So, why were we on a podcast about historical fiction? Yes. Well, we have a member of this parish, uh, Maria Harfey, who um, passed on to her husband, who is a an author of historical action and adventure fiction. 
who's written m many best-selling books, um, and he does a podcast uh, with another author, uh, Stephen Mackay. Um, so Stephen and Matthew asked us if we would talk to them about copyright, about what the implications are for artificial intelligence um, and authors. Mm. Um, and it was a brilliant conversation. Yeah, they it are, was. It are. was. It's a really good podcast, actually. Really interesting. It's really they've good. had some great. They've had Bernard Gormo on there. They have. Talking and that, about that the Last Kingdom. Good. Yeah. And then we got to go on it. And we did. And, uh, sort of and they waffle are waffle a bit about copyright. And they are also rock musicians. Yes. So that's where the rock bit comes in. Um, so we had some musical fun uh, and games there as well. We so yeah, you might want to check that out. Yeah, Josh has just put the link in. Yeah. Chat. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great podcast. Yeah. Um, and it kind of. It's on all the streaming platforms it is. as well as they have it on YouTube. But and it's, it, on... it's made us think. Yeah, we really do need to get our podcast edited. The rest of them. I did actually. I've started editing the next one. The next one is going to be good. Anyway. Excellent. This is one in the meantime. If you want to hear yet more waffle from yes. us. Yes. Uh, but it's in a different context, and they were, uh, yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they they were absolutely brilliant, and I, there's a big waffle I do about copyright history, isn't there? And, and mm. well, oh, yeah. we talk about copyright the musical with them. Oh as well. yes, we do. So yeah. those of you that may have heard us talk about that, we're developing the idea a bit more. Yes. Um, yeah. And I think we're we're developing a team. Next here, fifty years, it, I've got it, some things lined up I need to do. Yeah, yeah. And writing a musical is definitely on that. Okay. Shall list. we move on to some actual copyright news yes. rather than? uh that stuff so many people will have seen the articles around public domain day because it's it's sort of hit the public awareness disney because mickey mouse because when you talk about the duration of copyright how long copyright law lasts it's everyone's go-to thing to talk about disney yeah and their pressure on extending it but finally in the us this is the uh, Steamboat Willie from 1928 is finally mm. now in the public domain. Um, lots of commentary on it, some of it more mm. informed than others, mm. uh, but here we thought we'd link to this piece uh, from the Centre of the Study of the Public Domain, Jennifer Jenkins, who we saw speak um, uh, at events in the past. She was at the Creative Commons Oh yes, conference. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this yeah. one kind of really goes into the, the detail of it. Um, it did feature in, before Christmas in our um, Big Fat Copyright Quiz of the Year. It was, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but now it's, yeah, it's out there. So, so Mickey Mouse is not fair game, but Steamboat Willie, Mickey Mouse might be. Yes, and of course there are still protections around trademark law. Yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah. things to be aware but of. But somebody has already made some kind of horror version of it, is yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. OK, what else is coming up? So um, Knowledge Rights 21, um, the organisation um, that are doing work across Europe, looking at different aspects of kind of open access, open science, all those sorts of areas. They've got an event on the 29th of January, um, which is looking at legislative developments um, in Bulgaria and Slovenia. Yeah, so across Europe, there's lots of different approaches being taken to how um, to support open science, open scholarship, mm. rights retention is something that's happening in the UK. So institutions putting policies in place, but in in other countries there are also this: how can you get the same principles mm. enshrined in legislation so that the um, author accepting manuscripts, for example, could be made available um, immediately open access. Uh, so that's something that is worth. I've signed up to that. Mm. It would be worth going along if you're involved in that area yeah. in, in research, communication, and open science, open scholarship. And next, we have a blog post, which okay. we did share with people who are on List Copy Seek, I think. Yeah. Um, so this is from our friend, former uh, keynote at Ice Pops, not last year, year before, um, Douglas McCarthy, um, who's now at Delft University of Technology. And he's been talking about um, this recent piece of case law, um, the case um, which is looking at uh, whether you can uh, sell is it you know licenses for well, the case, domain work the case isn't the it? case doesn't itself uh, involve cultural heritage institutions and the licensing of public domain works the digital versions of but what it does do is it returns to um, a, a fundamental principle of copyright law about what is an original copyright work mm, and mm. do you have to uh, is it the labor skill and judgment sweat of the brow argument that was traditional in, in British copyright law, or is it the author's own intellectual creation test where 
in order for copyright to exist in something, it has to be free creative choices and it has to be an original intellectual expression. Um, so what this uh, court case THJ v Sheridan does is it clarifies something that in fact we already knew and which the UK government had already said that under UK law, it is the author's own intellectual creation. Mm. It isn't the sweat of the brow mm. um, doctrine anymore. Mm. So uh, it means that any institution, however sweaty you get while digitizing, however sweaty your brow becomes, while digitizing, um, unless you are also uh, demonstrating free and creative choices, which okay. is not the case if you are making an, uh, as close to an accurate digital facsimile mm. um, of mm. a two-dimensional work. Um, what about if you're doing it in a sa sauna? If you're doing it in the sauna, really? there is actually uh, an article in the news today about a, a Finnish sauna which has just received grade two listed status. It's in Kent. It's <laughs> oh, we, I saw that. We should yeah. go and visit it. Yes. Anyway, we digress. The the thing about this is that uh, Doug's post that he's uh, written for us and also published in his own website is useful because it summarizes a lot of other links. Actually, since he published this post, the British Association of Picture Libraries uh, and Agencies has put out a statement about mm. this and the implications. This one will run and run mm. because, in fact, um, there is clearly a tension here, yeah. and a tension that's based on the way that public uh, cultural institutions are funded yeah. and the expectation that there should be uh, revenue and uh, licensing revenue coming in. Um, so, this those of you that are in this in this world um, will will should be paying attention to what happens next certainly it's taking up a certain amount of my time at the moment yeah uh, but thanks to doug for for writing that for us and uh, we will be uh, reporting back on that as yes this, uh, yes developed. yes so next news story i mean it's kind of old news surely everyone's heard about this now but um you know obviously the latest rumblings in the copyright and ai um issue is the new york times just before christmas suing um open ai who created chat gpt uh, but also microsoft as well for saying um that some of their tools they've got this co-pilot tool that uh, we've been having a look at, at our institution um that you know for copyright infringement because they found that you know there are the articles have been harvested and another interesting case what's going to happen here who knows um it's something we had two webinars about last year um copyright and ai i would have yeah. thought it would be a topic that people will be interested in hearing about again later this year some more yeah, and keep yeah. an eye on this case but we've got another piece here which uh, i think would be useful for those of you who are looking at the implications um, of generative AI, large language models mm. on academic activities. And this one is particularly around academic publishing. Yeah. So it takes, it starts off, uh, so Jeff Pooley has written this piece um, on Upstream, um, which is a, a website created by Force 11. So it's looking at uh, developments in open scholarship. And um, so it, it's really interesting, this one, because it's about who has control over the scholarly record. And in fact, what does that control look like? Mm. Um, because it's uh, so much of the monetization around this for the commercial organizations about analyzing behavior um, of readers and of researchers um, so that the content itself is not necessarily the thing which has as much value as before it's in this world where we're looking at uh, tracking behavior and understanding uh, uh, using this for all sorts of uh, sort of mind-bendingly um, uh, kind of different reasons why you mm. would initially have control over the the underlying articles but definitely worth a read that one yeah uh, 15 minute read well worth your time here we go i'll have a look at it i haven't read that one yet okay i think you have i think you you said you'd scan read it i think i'd scan and read then it, I yeah. in some of the blanks. yes okay yeah, yeah. so we are are we at the end of our news we got any more news we got any more news no, we no. have no more news other than the news that we are delighted once again to have uh, another guest. And this guest is um, Sarah Hammond, um, who joins us from the University of Cambridge. Um, Sarah is one of our copyright Padawans um, who has been helping us with things related to copyright literacy, has put a huge amount of time and effort into um, this report um, in this presentation she's about to give that helps us uh, understand, you know, what people think of what we're doing here yeah um so sarah can we uh, hand over to you can we check whether your your mic and camera are working cool i think they are 
there Yay. we go well yeah. excellent sarah so thank you once again for coming and joining us so we'll hand over to you hopefully you have the ability to advance your slides and everything's okay um and uh we will let you show us what you've got to show us yeah take it thank away you. can i just check if i do that does it move for you as well it does yes it we does. can see Amazing. your slide. yes cool yeah. oh hey hi um Thanks to Jane and Chris for having me and doing the introduction so that I don't have to do that. Um, I'm Sarah, I work in Cambridge. Um, I am here as one of the copyright Padawans. Um, so over the last year and a half, we've been working on a survey um, to sort of evaluate how the webinars have been going, um, how they're being received, what you think of them, um particularly throughout the pandemic but also just sort of in general um and then that culminated in a report in november that we published on the website um at the time of writing that there were 63 webinars and we're now on 67 so you know they keep going which is good um I'll just summarise the report. Um, so the report was collating data and findings from two surveys that were circulated to copyright webinar attendees. So the one, the first one was in 2020 and the second one was in May of last year. Probably some of you on, on this or watching this back will have filled one of those in hopefully or both of them. Um, we had sort of a variety of question types so we could get a triangulation of responses. Um, that's a very fancy word for having numbers and like thoughts. <laughs> so different types of data. So we could have numbers sort of evaluating things, but also written opinions and, and actual thoughts to go with those. Um, Jane has put the link in the chat if you want to have a look. Um, and the main goal of the report and, and doing the surveys was to sort of compare and measure the, the webinar's impacts and, and reception to you and, and the relevance to sort of ongoing issues and topics um, throughout the pandemic, the early pandemic, different stages, and then all the changes that have been coming with that and in general with like the way that people are working and living and how the webinars fit into that. Um, there were two surveys. Um, they ended up being quite different. So even though not that different in the grand scheme of things. Um, so the first one ran quite early in retrospect in the pandemic. So late 2020, and that sort of has given a real snapshot of how the webinars were doing in the you know depths of the pandemic and early working from home and closures and all of those kind of things that have changed since and that was run through JISC surveys and I had nothing to do with that one um, I did write the second survey which went out in May roughly last year uh, it asked a lot of the same questions, but also some new ones to sort of get a bit more insight and see how things are changed and get some more comparison. And that was on run through Qualtrics, which is a very similar system, but different. Um, so they had different authors and different platforms, which has meant that some of the comparison has been more difficult because I don't know well, the data hasn't been in the same place and in the same format. And also, you know, two different people writing things will pitch things slightly differently. Um, but I think overall it, it's worked out quite well. Um, this is a quote from the feedback. Um, if you wrote this, then thank you, because uh, I've used it in literally everything. It's um, just a quote that sort of managed to summarise what, what lots of people in both surveys spoke to. So I just put it in as a nice little 
um, summary of, of the webinar's sort of general reception and what was coming out of the feedback. Um, and just in case, just to give it a little bit more context as well, here's sort of a vague timeline of when things were happening. So the survey ran in 2020, the first one, I, I think I sort of appeared and derailed everything in 2022. And then we drafted and planned the second survey sort of into 2023, ran that in May, and then had the report finalized and published by November. Um, so it did take quite a long time, um, but that is how things work when three people are trying to organize something who work in different places and have different lives. Um, and I think it has meant that we've been able to do a real like long comparison between the first and the second survey, um, which was really the point of running the second survey in the first place was to sort of have that point of comparison with the first one. In terms of responses, this probably won't shock anyone. Um, <laughs> this, they were, these are averages from both surveys. The responses for both were really similar, which is why I've just sort of averaged across them. Um, nearly everyone was based in the UK, except for I think one person in Sweden and one person in Denmark. Um, so a really heavy focus on UK attendees. Um, and most people were librarians, worked in copyright or scholarly communications. Um, and then the other section included things like um, lecturers, learning technology people. Um, no one really particularly like, you know, no farmers. Um, <laughs> so most people working within the realms of sort of higher education and information services. Um, which actually was reflected in this next one we asked in the second survey um, whether people's jobs were specifically related to copyright um, because that sort of gave a little bit of wider context to the, the job title area so I mean for example I my job title and my job are absolutely not related to copyright at all, whereas other people with a very similar job do focus on copyright. So it just sort of enabled that to be sort of evened out a little bit. Um, and you'll see from the slides that that was um, most, yeah, basically nearly everyone would say that they were at least somewhat working with copyright, which is good. Um, in terms of the webinars, because it means that it's, you know, we're not talking about a bunch of things that, that no one is really needing to hear. Um, we also asked how many webinars people had attended, um, both in the first and second survey, although these results are for the second one, just because so many more had run by the time the second survey went out. Um, most people seem to attend quite a lot, but also a, a quite a large proportion of people who responded did sort of like one in three or one in four. Um, so perhaps you people are picking based on topic, um, only attending the ones that they think will be relevant to them, that kind of thing. Um, we also asked about actual like mode of engagement. So whether people were tuning in live, watching the recordings, looking at the slides, contributing in the webinars, um, either as guest speakers or sort of in discussions. And also whether there was engagement outside of the webinars, so um, social media, that kind of thing. Um, and those, again, sort of really evened out between, not evened out, but, but matched up between the two surveys. Um, nearly everyone who responded to both tuned in live about two thirds also said they watched the recordings so pretty
presumably where things have been interesting or useful or wanted to refer back to things, having the recordings available has been really helpful. Um, lots of people seem to contribute um, in the webinars as a participant, you know, chiming in on discussions, getting involved on social media. Um, and it did seem like really everyone did did tend to tune in live and attend live and engage live um, as their main point of engagement, um, which is interesting. Uh, there must be something about the live show, as it were, that that is appealing to people. We also asked um, more in the second survey about the actual institutions people worked for and the context they worked in. Um, so 94% of people indicated that they work in the higher education sector. So that's 62 out of the responses. Um, so that's universities, um, not all libra libraries, information, scholarly communications, education, parts of that. And then some other people contribute from public libraries and the NHS. Um, this really helps to know because it means that in terms of organising the webinars, um, clearly it's material that sort of still focuses on higher education and the university context is going to be the most relevant to the attendees. Um, we also asked whether people were aware of sort of copyright colleagues attending or if they had a dedicated team in their institution. Uh, most people said no, so so about half, just over half said they definitely didn't have a de dedicated copyright team that they were aware of. Um, and about 30 people, so just under half said that they did. And very few were unsure, which is actually really good because it means people attendees seem to have a good awareness of sort of, I guess you would expect it, but a good awareness of the copyright situation um, where they work. And it also helps to sort of get a sense of when we're talking about sort of community, which we'll come on to, um, how important or, or not the online copyright community is if people don't have that in their sort of daily work life. So I'm just going to go on. Um, these are the sort of three main themes that came out of the more sort of qualitative and experience based feedback. So confidence that people reported sort of the webinars really helping to increase their general confidence in both their personal sort of life but also professional activity so dealing with copyright inquiries navigating copyright regulation and practice um, a few people mentioned how it sort of helped them with imposter syndrome and that their confidence grew generally in sort of tackling workplace copyright issues bringing things up to other people being able to answer things confidently um, another main one was belonging and community so the creation of the copyright sort of network and the relationships that people have made or continued through these webinars so people that they've met maybe in the chat and carried on a conversation elsewhere professionally or just having this like space to jump into on a Friday and you know all be in the same boat people especially in the first survey reported that that was um, really, really valuable during earlier lockdown and that sort of isolation and not being in their daily workplace and seeing colleagues that having like a regular online professional community that was quite lighthearted um, and a bit of an escape was really, really valuable. Um, a lot of people talked about how sort of positive and helpful the community is and that it wasn't constant like I think copyright and, and the related <laughs> challenges can be 
quite annoying um but having sort of the positive and like generous community in the webinars um people have really valued um and it's also quite interesting that that this one really went up so that the sort of levels of, of people reporting this was a lot stronger in the second one so kind of showing that over time as the webinars have gone on these things have got stronger and more important and the final sort of main one was awareness i mean we've had we've had the news section that that's been a staple and that has really helped increase people's sort of awareness and interest in new copyright issues but it's also the webinars in general have helped people sort of increase their general awareness and think of things that they maybe wouldn't think of before um and there's also been a real spread of copyright awareness from webinar attendees outwards into their institutions so that they can you know learn things or or think of things in the webinars learn about things and then leave the webinars and take them out into their workplaces and their sort of work activity and this again was a lot higher in the second one i think where people have had time to sort of come to a topic that that is useful to them um, some other things that came up quite a lot um, particularly in the second survey as people were sort of thinking more about non-pandemic practice um, it, it came out a lot both in the sort of demographic statistics and the feedback that the community is really UK based so perhaps there'd be room to improve international reach and content um, this one's an interesting one because obviously a lot of copyright happens within law which is UK based so it makes sense for things to be focused and there have been a lot of guests providing a UK perspective and that is reflected as as well that people when they were asked to feedback on their like sense of community internationally were reporting really low but in terms of perspective and awareness a lot higher so um that's clearly something the webinars are doing quite well is the sort of awareness side of that um, people reported the the role of the webinars in their career development so learning things from the webinars gaining the knowledge and the skills and the confidence have helped them um, progress in their career either officially or not but contributing to new initiatives or applying for a job that was more copyright focused that they now felt able to do so and um, people have really appreciated the opportunity to hear best practice from other institutions particularly ones that weren't necessarily similar to theirs so hearing what works and what hasn't worked and hearing the sort of individual perspective on that um, it was also i mean it, there is a strong focus on sort of higher education and further education and education related topics this is something to think about whether that needs to be expanded or if it sort of fits and serves the needs of the community and the webinar feedback sort of suggested that it did um, and lots of people mentioned the style of the webinars um, they were fun and interesting and inclusive and especially during the early sort of lockdown and pandemic when the webinars were quite new that it was like a real escape um, to have a bit of fun and a song um, <laughs> I would say it wasn't like there was negative feedback as well not very much and some of it from the first one was addressed by the time the second one ran so things like specific topics people thought were missing things a few other things and I the a few people fed back on sort of feeling that they didn't like the style um, and they wanted it to be more serious or more factual and they didn't want a song um, I, I, Sarah, just coming in. I mean, I yeah. think, I think we'll, we'll come back to this in a moment, yeah. But of course, singing is just part of what, what we do, really. Um, we're probably yeah. can we? Can we uh, I think we're going to move on to the next bit in about five minutes' time. So, can we? Is, is that okay if we can kind of? Yeah, I had one slide minutes? left, so 
Oh, uh, okay, good stuff. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just going to overview the outcomes. So we presented, I presented a draft report and sort of a much simpler version of these slides at the oh, Cool SIG AGM last year. We've published the report on the Copyright Literacy website. Um, we've got this huge wealth of, of feedback and ideas from you and other attendees on, on what the webinars could do or incorporate or look like. Um, but there's also a really solid evidence base that the webinars are sort of being well received, um, having a really useful and important impact on copyright awareness and copyright activities. Um, so there's two things to draw on. And this is just a word cloud from all of the text feedback of what came up a lot. Um, obviously, copyright is the biggest one, but it just sort of gives a sense of, of people's thoughts. And that is it for me. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. <laughs> no, no, that was fantastic. Uh, just, and and uh, we're going to ask people if they've got questions, things that they would like to ask you about what it was that you found and and, and your analysis of that. Just to say, um, I know at the beginning you kind of touched on some of the challenges involved in picking up a piece of work that had been started from elsewhere. We just want to say you've done a fantastic job on this. Mm. Um, and I think as anybody who's been involved in this, any kind of research knows, there's always a bit of, uh, you know, there's, there's some there's some legwork in order to make sense of it and take two different um, bits of data, one created by someone else and another collected by another. But uh, you've done a really great job and it's just been really helpful to us. So, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Did anything surprise you in the findings? That was one thought I had. Did, was there anything? Because I think we we felt the first survey we tried, we were more involved in it. And mm. I think this one we tried to sort of didn't we leave you to do it in some ways? We gave you some pointers, but was there anything then that surprised you in the findings? Yeah, I mean, I was actually surprised that there wasn't more um, sort of constructive criticism or, or I feel like normally when you open up an anonymous text box, people have the opportunity to mm -hmm. say, <laughs> um all sorts of things and really actually there was yeah <laughs> there was actually like a really tiny tiny proportion of things that people didn't like um yeah and that indeed and, and i mean it's really good record, but i was Sarah, surprised where do, stand, where do you stand on the singing debate um, is it a good thing or not <laughs> oh you put her on the spot now. i put her on the spot <laughs> No comment. No comment. <laughs> Excellent. That's perfectly the correct answer. Um, does anybody, I mean, we're going to come to a, a discussion really about the future of what happens next in the group in a moment. Does anybody, before we move on to that, have any questions that they would like to ask Sarah or? Yes, yeah, so you can put your hand up else? or you can put something in the chat. If not, well, well, we can move on, I think, to the next bit of what we've got to say. Um, and anyone can be thinking of what they would want to ask um, and we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that in a moment but thanks again Sarah for having done this work um, and for uh, joining us today joining us today and, yeah. and taking us through this it's been um, it, it's just really great to have some actual data to base this on rather than than impressions and it just seems like people are still um, finding these useful so yeah. you know basically here is uh what we this means for the, the the copyright and online learning special interest group which is the the group that we are currently co-chairs of um and we're the ones that, su that support the webinar and it's under the the overall alt and their special interest group umbrella that we do this work so there's an annual report available online which is i'm just going to pop the link in because i think that wasn't up until yesterday yeah, so, so what we I'll, did I'll put the link what, what's that. happened over the last year summarizing what the group has done um, we do plan to continue running the webinars. We do. It seems like nobody tells us not to. And I think the thing is, people keep turning up. Yeah. So if people turn up, clearly, yeah. you know, when yeah. when the numbers start dwindling, right yeah. down to nothing, we won't just be sitting here talking to no one. Yeah. But uh, one one of the things we have been having a bit of a chat with Alt, haven't we, about mm. some things and about thinking about whether some of you know what we could do as well, we might 
take to a broader audience through their yeah. webinar program so that you know, I think we feel our community comes here to us, but there's probably a message where we could be talking yeah. to people outside that community. Yeah. And we probably would need to do that in a slightly different way. I because... think so. If we look at what ALT is about, the Association for Learning Technology, many of their members are people who are learning technologists or people who are yeah. doing uh using learning technology and are not necessarily the go-to copyright person no they don't need to, they don't need to go thing. into the detail but yeah. it's the kind of what are the 10 key things that they might need to know yeah. and to kind of to be able to sort of then flag up the role of copyright specialists in institutions to say you probably have one go and talk to them yeah but you know here's some stuff you can work out yourself and in some way we see that what we're doing here with these webinars what we do with the group is it's the kind of online and public sort of way in to what has already been happening in the list copy seat community for many years so yeah it's though and so we're and that's many of the people that are on the call today and generally do tune in and i think we recognize that that's part of the the power of of you know what makes these work but when it comes to the group itself mm. there is a handbook on how these special interest groups should be run chairs cannot be chairs for more than three years no nope. so our tenure is over mm -hmm. it's the end of this particular era um however there is uh, an opportunity if no one wants to come forward for us to continue mm. as co-chairs and there's a process there that needs to be gone through so there's a um we need a new secretary because our do, secretary yeah. is standing down yeah. and the co-chairs need to be uh or the chairs or co-chairs need to be confirmed whether that's us or whether someone else wants to come um and, and we were thinking also about possibly creating a vice chair role weren't we which yeah. might be somebody that if we were standing again if we did if nobody else wanted to be chair then we could have a vice chair who might be somebody who could be kind someone of that mentor. we could help develop into yeah. that role because we do appreciate that suddenly taking charge of something um from someone else might seem a bit daunting yeah. so we're going to so even if you're not on the committee at the moment yeah. you will be able to um put yourself forward won't you as part yeah. of this process to so, join the committee to take on one of the roles yeah. um so there'll be an expression of interest um and if need be then i will run some elections so we'll make sure that that goes out um widely to the people that are signed up as members on the list but the important thing here with all of this is in order to be part of that conversation, you need to join up to yeah. the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group, which is as simple as following this link to this JISC mail list and joining. Yeah. Um, you can just join straight up and you will get all of the communications around this. So thanks, Josh, for putting. putting Excellent. The link Cheers. Thank you there. very much. Um, so I think what we wanted to do at this stage, I mean, we've got some. Uh, future webinars you know things that are coming up so on the um, 2nd of February we're being joined by Claire Painter and Professor Emily Hudson um, who are two of the authors of uh, this uh, report on third-party copyright and research output something commissioned by uh, UKRI and that came out last year and it's actually a really helpful uh, piece of work it's it has relevance to all the elements of copyright because it talks about copyright permissions and copyright uh, exceptions um, and in the context of open access. But there are other we you know, we're planning on running the copyright specialist session again. Yes. Um, so we'll be know. looking for people who might want to speak yeah. at that. Yeah. And we are going to be talking to the people behind the alt ethical frameworks so of the ethical use of learning technology and how that links to copyright. Um, we've got some other possible topics there. But again, this is open. This is a, a, an opportunity for others to come up with ideas now. Yeah. Does anybody um want to share an experience or a thought or a thing that might be useful that we're not currently doing or a way of doing it that we haven't been doing it um, yeah so we'll open up the floor if anyone wants to ask anything ask anything so um let's see if anyone put anything in the chat i think it's just the two links in the chat yeah it might be a tumbleweed moment it might anyone be people might just if you just want us to carry on coming up with stuff and yeah. just you can sit there and listen to whatever it is we have to say. I mean, we've got some really good ones coming up, but really this is this the point of this, as far as we're concerned, is it's about community. We should be reflecting what people want to know. We actually also one of the things we do have, I think, on the website. So if afterwards um, mm -hmm. you think of something, we added um, a page, I think, where you can put suggestions 
Um, oh, Kate's asked for ah, something. Supporting yeah. open software licensing. That's an interesting one. Uh, it is something actually that um, I've been discussing with my own institution. I mean, Kate, do you want to come on? Have you got your mic and your uh, camera working? Do you want to actually uh, talk us through? Ah, right there you are. Hello. Kate, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, go on. I'll, I'll risk putting the video on. Uh, my house is absolutely. <gasps> okay. Um, <laughs> I've had damp work done, so I've got no radiators, so I am swaddled. Oh. <laughs> and, don't, don't I hope you really got cozy enough. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not great. Um, yeah, open software licensing is something that I'm doing an awful lot more work supporting um, okay. researchers. And just, yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that the more you do, the more you kind of go this is huge this is massive um and it's it's fascinating and it's just a, a sort of is it if anyone else is doing it how they're finding it um what's working what's not that kind of thing okay um yeah that, I've, I've got fantastic. i've got a colleague at oxford who is very uh, up on these things and, and and may be able to come and join us someone from from it um, at Oxford, who is a very strong supporter of open source software, um, and that, but that is an area. There's there's loads and loads in that. So I guess the question is, what's is there a specific angle on it? Is it is it a general primer to this and how it interacts with other aspects of open scholarship, or is it something specific? I think I think I think this is a thing. Of, it it could be what people want it to be, because yeah, um, okay. Going, I mean, part of it is. A question of without knowing in advance are other people doing this because if other people are already sort of supporting this area of work within their copyright roles then I think that leads to a slightly different more in-depth discussion if lots of people aren't but they want to know mm. what it's like and, and sort of like how to how to begin doing it because it is very different then that would be a different kind yeah. of obsession so I just yeah. okay. No, we'll we'll, we'll we'll throw that out there. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks. A really one. good one. And it's making me think a lot of ideas about how we. I, I mean, I think what might be an interesting angle, given that we've heard from Sarah that our main um, audience here and most of us working in academic libraries, I think there's probably a really interesting thing about how do academic libraries, with their focus on openness and copyright support, link with computer scientists and mm. IT departments and uh, to sort of make sense of this very big world and within an institution because in my experience what you've got is you've got computer scientists wanting to openly give away stuff and then you've got innovation and exploitation or you know those teams wanting to monetize it and it's like how do you make sense of that yeah. so uh, I think that's a good topic Let, let's yeah. definitely return to that yeah well, thank you Kate yeah I think we involved like we're getting the, uh, the damp work sorted the damp is done. We're just waiting for the plaster to dry, and it's a bad time of year. So oh uh, just, god, just oh. it's all right in this in this warm summery weather. It'll be fine. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple more things. So Deborah said about having AI, and I think we've definitely got you know we can line something up mm, probably mm -hmm. you know for a bit later in the year to have another update. Yeah, because we had we had Alex come and join us, which was great. Alex Fenner. Birmingham we had a follow-up discussion on it. I think that's sort of where are we now what have we seen and what are we saying in terms of our guidance yeah um, yeah and I think what would I know who would be interested in that someone a researcher that we know who has actually been looking into what institutions say with their guidance oh yes yeah yeah, so, yeah. yeah. yes yeah let's get yeah. Guido and see if he's, yeah that would be excellent, um, actually yeah 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 Liesl's hit on something which is pretty yeah. central to what we've been thinking about for many years uh, yeah. so uh, saying possibly less helpful for most attendees but I'd really like early career copyright specialist guide and then the leap from doing a job which featured copyright prominently to working as the copyright expert uh, for my institution was a large one I've had similar for others on jumping into being the copyright contact mm. yeah and and I you know I've everybody who is in this world has been through that process or is going through that process yeah. because uh, and there isn't a sort of structured training program to do it. No. Uh, and I think there's one of the challenges we had, in fact, when we did the first uh, report, um, we looked at what people were asking for. And there is a difference between providing a structured 
kind of education program or course mm. Mm. versus having a community and bringing sort of topics and discussing them yeah because actually providing that structure does require a bit more um work yeah to do it but i, I think there are certain things that we could be doing as a community that might actually help more um, yeah, with some of the more experienced people sharing their knowledge yeah. and putting that together. And, and that, is, be... that is really what we hoped to have a project, didn't we, mm. as part of the, the call set, to do that. I think it's yeah. just finding the time. Again, and I, what I would actually say is if people are interested in this, if people yeah. are either interested in Come contributing to do it yeah. or, or, or saying these are the things I don't get and I feel, you know, I'm an expert. We've heard this a lot. I'm the expert, but I feel odd coming and asking people what the answer is because I should already know mm. then I, th that is you know if you join the call so that's something that the, the group has been talking about and how best to support that mm. uh, one idea I do have is is there just a thread on CopySeq mm. which we crowdsource and we come up with that these are the things you need to know mm. and then we just link that as a permanent thread and then we can kind of share some stuff but again yeah how how, how would that work but yeah um Good one, thank you, Liesl. Yeah, and then uh, Josh has said about um, uh, ebook lending, but also particularly thinking about public libraries as well. Mm. I mean, I think it's something to do with, I mean, it's an ongoing topic, isn't it? Ebook lending, licensing, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, we're intending, I'm sure we've got controlled digital lending on our um, uh, list of topics. Mm -hmm. We'll say hopefully more about that fairly soon, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, there will be there will be more information coming out about that. But what we also try to do is link to those other events taking place where they do mm. they do sort of take that wider view. Um, uh, and, you know, Knowledge Rights 21, for example, have run quite a few of these that we they have. Point that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely on our list of things. Yeah. And it may get people from other sectors to come along as well, because mm. I think it is it is an issue it's how much you know s control and say public libraries have got they're mm -hmm. working with a lot of suppliers aren't they i think when it comes to ebooks that they're quite limited in what they can do and then it's all wrapped up in licensing rather than copyright as such yeah but great great topics yeah okay that's good well anything anyone else wants to say or add to this conversation about what we're doing here, what we're doing with the group and how it might work. Because if not, if not, I hmm. think that's great. And we can move on to the final thing just to uh, remind you what we've got coming up. So please make a date in your diaries for the 2nd of February. I think we're both trying to do the same thing. Now. We are we're doing the same thing at the same time. I'm yeah. going to beat you. I've beaten you. You've beaten yes. me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, please put that date. That's going to be another excellent. I know one. that's actually a change of date from what it we did is. originally yeah. advertise yeah. Um, because the speakers have asked us to change it. So we've brought it forward a week. It was you might have it in the calendar as the 9th of Feb, but it's definitely not. It's the 2nd of Feb, and I think yeah. I've changed it. Um, oh, and thank you, Sarah. Oh, thank you, Sarah. So yes. you, Sarah, just put her contact details in the chat there for anyone who wants to contact her if they've got any. Um, questions yeah. uh, about that. So I think at this point we're going to stop the recording. Well, you can do one last thing. You want to do the one last thing? I you want to be recorded. Okay. All right. Um, well, for those of you that uh, 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 had thoughts about singing, um, what we're going to do here? This is this is your birthday cake. Oh my goodness! Yes. This is your I didn't know you were cake. actually planning on singing though. <laughs> we are, and your guitar is going to be in tune. Yeah. So we are going to do. It. So what we will we, we've done this before on on people's uh birthdays yes you um, can bring that cake down if everyone like can that. open up their mics and you can all sing along if you're in a position to see <laughs> now we have people leaving but some of you will stay and some of you know if you open up your mics you can sing along now it will sound cacophonous but that doesn't matter because no. uh, we're all in it together so it's not quite in tune but it doesn't matter so it's <laughs> happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Woo! Hooray! We got the most amazing noises coming. That was absolutely beautiful. It was like a beautiful choir. Okay, on that note, 
we will say thank you everyone for coming. Yes, thanks thank again you. to Sarah. Yeah, thanks uh, also for, to Josh for and Josh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And we will see you all again. And yes, that was my birthday cake. Yes, it was indeed.